Well, welcome to all the congregations that are joining us. For those of you that join us in prisons today, it's great to have you with us. We're in the second week of our series on Romans, and if you don't know, we've encouraged you to buy this book because we're following along, and we had Andrew Ollerton, wasn't he fantastic last week? We had him launch last week for us, and we'd really encourage you to buy this book. If we sell out today, then you'll have to get them yourselves on Amazon or something else. But he mentioned last week the quote from David Suchet that's on the front of here. And if you don't remember David Suchet, there's a picture of him here. He is Sir David Suchet, and he used to play, most famously known for playing Poirot. And he says this, On all my travels, if I had the Gospels... Paul's letter to the Romans and Andrew Ollerton's book, I would need nothing else. Quite an accolade. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be great to get David Suchet to come and read to Romans to us? But well, budget does not go that far. So I found him on the internet, and here he is reading, 2 minutes 33 seconds, the section that we're going to look at today. Now, originally, the letter, as we know, was sent by Paul via Phoebe, and the letter would have been read out by Phoebe. Well, we couldn't have Phoebe, obviously, but here is David. Imagine the believers in Rome, there would have been slaves and there would have been owners and business people. There would have been all kinds of different nationalities. They probably met in secret in homes or in garden sheds or in work sheds after work. Imagine that's us. And we're all leaning in because Phoebe's going around the city and she's reading it out to us out loud. That's the way the scriptures in the New Testament were first understood. And here we have David Suchet. Take a listen. Romans. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake, and you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith. It goes on to say, because I want the last bit, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I don't know whether you prefer my voice or David Suchet's, they're very similar. <laughs> I was 17 years of age. It was my baptism day. I don't know why I'd waited till, till 17 for baptism because I'd grown up in a church, but it was at the age of 16 that I had an encounter with Jesus Christ 
at a concert in Liverpool with Graham Kendrick and Eric Delve speaking. He spoke about the agony that Jesus went through, and I responded to the gospel that was preached that night. I went home. I was still just about in church. I went home, told my youth pastor that I'd had a very emotional encounter last night with Jesus, that I really had given my heart to him fully, and my youth pastor said to me, it won't last, lad. Thank you. I said, well, I just want to tell everyone about Jesus. And he kind of rolled his eyes. I just wanted to tell everyone I was not ashamed of this gospel. I got up, I'd invited all my friends, Bimo and Evo, and other O's that were all there, and they were all there, all my friends, because I couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Everyone I met, I wanted, I had nicknames ranging from one boy used to call me Jesus, another guy used to call me Billy, short for Billy Graham, I had usual Bible basher, Bible thumper, weirdo, and maybe I made some mistakes, <laughs> in the way I went about witnessing in those times. Graffiti on a toilet door shouldn't be allowed. But I wanted to tell everyone about Jesus. So I invited all my friends. And they're sniggering because the church that I was in for the baptism, we didn't have T-shirts that said, I have decided we had long black flowing gowns with lead around the bottom that kept the skirt down as you went up. So I walked in, all my friends are there, all sniggering at me. And I got up and I said something like this, I have decided to follow Jesus. And today is my public declaration of my faith in him. And then I read a verse from Romans, what is thought to be one of the earliest statements of faith that was probably read at baptisms in the Rome. I read this, Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scriptures say, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. And then I eyeballed every one of them. And I said to them, and I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And not one of them sniggered then, because they knew something had happened in me that had changed my life. I went into the water. I remember the skirt lifted up because there wasn't enough lead on the bottom. But no one was laughing because they knew this was real. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And if there's one thing we want from this series in Romans, it's that your confidence, and everyone who's listening, your confidence in this gospel of God, that the Apostle Paul calls it there in verse 1, this universal gospel, this eternal gospel, this gospel that is always relevant, this gospel that is sufficient for all humanity, this gospel that is sufficient even for the cosmos, we'll say more about that later, we want you to be confident in this gospel. To be able to not arrogantly, but confidently, with shoulders back, heads up, say, I am not ashamed of this gospel. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, didn't start off believing this gospel. This well-educated Pharisee persecuted Christians. He was there holding the coats while others were stoned to death. He was an opposer of this Christian sect. He was not a believer, till he had an encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, which changed everything. And then, from then on, because of the commission that God gave him, he wanted everyone to know, everyone to know that they did not need to be ashamed. This was a life-transforming gospel. And he knew that it was for everyone, both Jew and Gentile, which in this kind of terminology means everyone, could be saved through the gospel. And the church at Rome, when he writes to them, had been around for some time. It wasn't an, a, a, a new church, and he hadn't visited them. He had this great desire to visit them, and he wanted them to be united because what had happened is the Jews had been 
thrown out of the city for some time. And then when they returned, when they were allowed to, they found the church that they'd left was different than the one they were there before. They were no longer talking about circumcision. They were no longer practicing eating kosher food. They, there was this difference, and they were struggling to connect again. And the Apostle Paul, this comes all the way through Romans, is trying to encourage them, no, our unity is not in the foods we eat or our ethnicity. Our unity is in Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It unites us all. So what's the, what's the backstory? Well, we read it, or David Suchet read it for us. It starts off with his name, Paul. Now, if we write a letter, we do it very differently. Our name comes at the end. In the ancient world, the name usually came at the beginning. So I'm writing uh, an email. It always starts with, hey, or hi, or dear. If I'm writing a letter, which is very unusual, dear Auntie Anne, because everyone's got an Auntie Anne, haven't they? You'd say who you're writing to, but not Paul. We know straight away, through dictation, we heard it last week, he is writing, it's him who's the author. And it says, we know it was Phoebe, I said that at the beginning, who was delivering it. And she was a, we don't know much about Phoebe, but if you read Romans 16, you find, you find out that she's called a sister, a deacon, which is the word servants, and a benefactor. This was a great lady. But Paul uses this word when he starts off. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's use the proper word. He uses the word slave, doulos. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, most of us, all of us, I hope, resist the concept of slavery. Someone else owning another human being shouldn't be allowed. It's vile. And we know history shows the nature of And we can't have enough disgust for that. But here, Paul, who is a free man, he's an educated Jew, he's a citizen of Rome, he's a free man. This free man willingly says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. He has no problem saying he's a slave. There's a beautiful picture in the Old Testament, we can't read it for the sake of time, but of this concept of being a slave, a a willing slave. I think it's Exodus 21, and what would happen is if a Jew had been in financial problems, they would often sell themselves into slavery. But they could only serve as a slave for six years, and the seventh year they had to be declared free. What a great concept. But in that seventh year, or after six years, if the slave did not want to go free because he loved his or her master, and because his master or, was so kind and considerate, and they had this relationship, the slave would say, I don't want to go free. Don't set me free. I want to stay here. And they had this practice where they would take a sharp instrument And they would get the ear of the slave and they would put it on the doorpost and they would pierce the ear of the slave. And the slave, by saying this, by the way, wasn't saying, oh, and I'm going to serve you for another six or seven years. The slave was then saying, I never want to be free. I want to serve in this house for the rest of my life. And there was a sign that they walked around with at all times that they were no longer a free man or woman and the sign was a hole in their ear. It was one of the Psalms where it's prophetically speaking of Jesus where he says, my ears you have pierced for I delight to do your will, O God. We used to sing a song, I'm not going to sing it. Well, maybe I will. <laughs> it, go, it just went very simple like this. Pierce my ear, O oh Lord my God. Take me to your door this day. 
I will serve no other God. A free man I'll never be. Do you know, thank you. Do you know the only way you can be free is if you become a slave to Jesus? It's the only way to freedom is become a slave to Jesus. Now, Jesus was himself, he used that word doulos. It's used of him rather in Philippians chapter 2. It says, when he took on the form of a servant, it's the word doulos. He became a bond slave. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a community, a church, where 30% of them would have been slaves. And they were not nice slave owners. And so this free man is saying to the slaves, I'm a slave too, but I'm not a slave to any man. I'm a slave to Jesus Christ, my Lord. Here's my question to you. Are you a free slave? I am. I've got a pierced ear. I'm going nowhere else. There is nowhere else to go where you'll find freedom. There is nowhere else that you will go that you will find a master like Jesus. Every other master will destroy you, but not Jesus. Pierce my ear. Take me to your throne this day. In verse 6 here, he says this to them. And you also are among those who are called to belong. It's, it's slave language. It's servant language. You belong to Jesus. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Now, we know who some of these specific free slaves were. Because if we're able to and jump to the last chapter of Romans 16, Paul actually names more names are mentioned in this section, in Romans chapter 16, of people that he specifically wants to mention in Rome. More names are mentioned here than in all the other epistles that Paul wrote put together. So people say Paul wasn't very, he was austere, he was not very relational. These are beautiful greetings that he brings to different ones who are in Rome. And if you read that chapter, and I encourage you to, there are names that are Latin names, so in other words, from a kind of Roman context, there are Greek names, and there are Jewish names. There are names of slaves, and there are names of owners. There are names of women, and that, you know, that might not sound like, in a patriarchal kind of context like this that didn't value women, to name women in the way that he did, Phoebe, a servant, a benefactor, a deacon, someone who is a leader in the church, this was radical stuff. And he writes to them all, chapter 16. And you can feel the warmth of his love, the family kind of language that he uses about them. One he talks about was like my mother, another to my sister or my brother. It's all this sense of belonging together as free slaves. And then he says this, I was caught by this verse. I'm going to read it to you. 16, verse 16. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, fear not. I'm not about to introduce some kind of new method of greeting. But why does he say, greet one another with a holy kiss? It's because there was an infamous kiss that everyone knew about by this stage, that was a very unholy kiss. Who was that? Anyone like to think of an unholy kiss in the Bible? Judas. Judas who betrayed Jesus with a kiss. This is very cultural, we understand, and all of that, but he's basically saying to them, you guys who are family, you all are brothers and sisters, you who belong to one another, don't be like Judas. Let there be no Judases amongst you. Rather, holy, holy kiss. Greet one another. With, don't stab one another in the back. Don't harm and pull each other. Don't betray each other. Don't be like Judas. 
holy kissing only. Now, in our kind of context, it might not be a kiss. Though I have had some friends, church leaders, who when I see them, men, men, they, they give me a kiss on the cheek and it feels holy. Because it's not about the, the kiss, it's about the motive. You hear that? And when we, we, what we tend to do, what do we tend to do? Some of us are huggy. Some of us are. Others of us shake a hand. Others of you, you might do a kiss. Some of you from other cultures across the globe, it's quite normal to do that. So it's not about what we're doing. What we're saying is find a way to express your familiar, your family relationship. And when you're giving that person a hug, please do not think of in any way betraying them and walking away and saying, oh, I just gave so-and-so a hug, but you know what they're like, don't you? Because it's not about the hug, it's about the heart. And the Apostle Paul is encouraging us here, find a way to express your love for one another so as that you know you are in Christ. Well, but we're all different. Beautiful. That's the whole idea. In our differences, and this is what it was in Rome, they were so different, Romes and Greeks, slaves and masters, rich and poor. Greet one another with a holy kiss because you're in the same family. You belong to each other. So do we. I'll say more about that at the end. This is what Scott McKnight says in the book that Andrew's written. He says, Diversity shaped every moment of the Roman house churches. But Paul sought a unity in a diversity, a sibling relationship. I love that. In Christ that both transcended and affirmed one's ethnicity, gender, and status. We're brothers and sisters. We belong together. Two things as I draw in to point out about this gospel. Number one, this is what Paul says at the end of this section. Our enemies have been defeated by the risen Jesus Christ. The word for gospel is the word evangelion. And it literally, it wasn't a religious word, it literally means to pronounce or announce good news. So if there's been a battle and there was a victory that had been secured, they'd send someone to announce the evangelion, the good news, we've won! So a, a good news announcement for us might be, the baby's born, it's a girl! Or it could be Liverpool beat Arsenal! Or anything that's good news in that way. I got the job. I'm getting married. That's an announcement of good news. And that's what the gospel is. Evangelion is a good news announcement. And it was applied particularly to those that had brought peace and victory. So certainly it applied to those who were the Caesars of the day they brought peace and prosperity, social and political. So when it's said about Jesus Christ being Lord, this is a very radical statement. Because it's basically saying, you know all those cups that we've got with Caesar's face on? You know those coins that we have because he thinks he's Lord? Do you know those statues we have to walk past every day and show respect to because Caesar's Lord, isn't he? This is the gospel saying, the gospel of God, there is no other Lord. He's defeated every enemy and his name is Jesus. Oh, and you want proof? You want proof that Jesus is Lord? Look at verse 4. It says, and he who through the spirit of holiness was declared with the power of the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. It tells us that this is what was prophesied by the prophets. It tells us that he's in the line of David, the closest thing in the Old Testament that they had to a Messiah. It says, this is the one who's been risen from the dead. Last word, he's Lord. This is proof he's defeated all his enemies. Again, in the book, and I've said this to you many times, I'd really encourage you, not to shrink the gospel. Remember that film, that movie, Honey, I've, sh- I've Shrunk the Kids? Well, don't shrink the gospel. 
Don't make it so small that all it's about is me and my personal salvation. Though, by golly, it's about me and my personal salvation. But he uses this picture in there of nesting dolls. And I bought these, and they've got images of Rome on them, I have you now. I bought them from Holy Art, if any of you would like to buy some nesting dolls. Personal salvation, you won't say it's very small, is really important. The gospel is about my personal salvation, but it's not only about my personal salvation. It's also about, so the gospel is the same, it's Jesus Christ has defeated all enemies, but it's all about a gospel that unites us in Christ. So it's about me and you. It's not just, that's why when we worship, it's not just about me and how I, what I get out of it. It's about I'm worshiping with others. This is a station of heaven. This is the kingdom coming amongst us as we worship. So it's bigger than my personal salvation, though it's important, but it's us all one in Christ Jesus. Every ethnicity, every one of us, male and female, we're in Christ. And then, of course, and we'll see this later on in Romans 8, it's even bigger than that. This gospel can be applied to the whole of creation because creation is longing and groaning and it's reconciliation is only found in one person. His name, Jesus Christ. Oh, and you want proof of this? He rose from the dead. Hip, hip. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> Easter's coming. That's the proof. He rose from the dead. So it's personal. It's relational, but it's cosmic, man. It's about the whole of creation. And then finally this. Not only can we celebrate because the gospel of God is for everyone, but it's the righteousness of God that's imputed to us. That means it's counted as our own through coming to faith in Christ. Through faith, we unlock the door of righteousness in Christ. What? Not just pious Jews. No, no. Not just people who follow certain rules and regulations. No, no, no. This is why I wanted to read the end. It's the just who live by faith. So our faith unlocks the key to the door of the righteousness of God being imputed to us, which means it's counted as mine. So when God looks at me and when God looks at you, he says, righteous, holy, clean. Not because of anything I've done, not because of the right foods I've had, not because of my background, because of my faith in the blood of Jesus Christ who purchased my salvation. It's for everyone. I'm going to show you a testimony as I close. It's actually on the Bible Society website if you want to go back and share it again. Because I want us to know this gospel of God, that's the phrase Paul uses, is sufficient for all time. We do not have to try to manipulate it to be applicable to our world because it's always applicable to our world. We don't have to go into different cultures and try and change the essence of it, though we may change the method of communication because it's the same gospel that's for all people, all time, all places. It's for eternity. It's universal. This gospel of God for which we are grateful. Take a look at this testimony and how it's worked out in one man's life. In Jesus' name, watch this. I uh, grew up in an uh, Islamic environment uh, in Iran. Uh, when I was 18 years old, that was the first time I um, heard the gospel through my brother. He was struggling with life, depression, uh, taking some drugs. And after he um, prayed with his friend, Christian friend, his life completely changed. One day I saw a book in his hand, um, in, on the book in Farsi was written the good news of Jesus Christ. And I prayed, and after the prayer, I, I just felt a huge peace in my heart that I never experienced in my life. A year after my conversion, uh, one of my aunties, uh, she tried uh, a lot to convince me that Christianity is wrong and I should go back to my Islamic faith. So she knew a university lecturer who was an uh, expert in religions. As the lecture was 
arguing with me i was answering him uh, according to the book, book of romans just how their religion can't save us but the grace of god i shared my testimony that how god changed me through this gospel and the lecturer i remember he didn't have anything else to say and after this meeting my auntie who take me to this meeting to convince me that christianity is wrong she gave her heart to jesus and then my dad and my sister gave their heart to jesus and they were really wanted to meet other christians and to find out more about our faith so in a some miraculous ways we found uh, a couple of family started to meeting up uh, with each other one day yeah the intelligence service raided into my house it took all the books and video discs and everything was related to christianity and then they put handcuffs and blindfold and arrested me and other leaders they put me in solitary confinement over a month and then sent me to prison and they kept me there for three years it was a very small cell just a blanket and pillow in the room and a toilet at the end in one of those moments that i was feeling really low and feeling really tired of the situation i realized that god has put me there for a reason and that's the reason is to share the gospel with other prisoners some fellow prisoners uh, came to me asking about christianity and we shared with them and some were sentenced to death and they came to christ and some of them were giving this testimony that i know if i even if i die i will be with jesus because the peace and the security i experience now i never had it in my life that's the power of gospel and that's why i can say with paul that i'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of god for our salvation if you enjoyed this video today why not give it a like furthermore why not subscribe to our channel as we seek to share the light and love of jesus into your life